this works right that's fine no, no, no that's fine okay good morning everyone uh, myself Pramod and I'm going to talk about uh, MPI stack for detailed neuron simulations I put this talk a bit differently compared to others so what I'm going to do is instead of talking about a specific technical area or like computing architectures or performance of MPI uh, what I'm going to present is a scientific use case of what it means to build the brain and simulate a brain and how basically MPI is helping us uh, in this exciting research so what I'm going to uh, this is the brief agenda for the talk I will briefly describe what the blue brain project is I assume most of the people here are not from computational neuroscience domain so I'll briefly describe what we are doing what it means to build the detailed neuron model uh, what is the computing platforms we are using and how we are using MPI stack some examples of how MPI pitch 2 is helping us and how we deploy the MPS stack in production and there will be some slides about the feedback and possible questions so let's get started uh, the blue brain project is oops blue brain project is based at EPFL so EPFL is research institute and university in Switzerland it is one of the two Swiss federal institute uh, in Switzerland you might have heard about ETH Zurich being the another one there are around 11,000 students and four to 5,000 academic staffs. This including the technical staff, around 400 to 500 uh, uh, professors in the university. So this is the, the library, the Rolex center of, of the university. There is a lake here, and then that is the French side, uh, you know, across the lake. So the Blue Brand project started in 2005 as a research center in EPFL Lausanne but we then moved to this campus biotech building in Geneva uh, like four years ago so the campus biotech is basically hub for life science research and most of the labs that are doing computational neuroscience or biology related research they move to this nice campus in Geneva if you move to the fifth floor you can see the Swiss Alps and you know the Mont Blanc so this is not bad place to be so this is all about where are we uh, from so let's understand what people are trying to do there so brain is the most complex organ in the human body and there is a lot of research and large projects you might have heard about that people are putting efforts to understand how brain works so uh, there are different initiatives uh, if again you are from computer neuroscience background uh, for example, there was a brain initiative in a US human brain project in Europe similar projects in Asia as well in Japan and in China and People are talking about uh, simulating a uh, millions of neurons and billions of neurons, you know the over the last decade or two and All this is to understand basically how brain fundamentally works and also basically uh, develop the new medicines or future computing technology and treat the diseases better but if you heard about uh, like people saying we simulated a million neurons or billion neurons what we have to understand is at what scale we are really talking about some people say say a neuron you can consider just as a point and then you can put together those lots of neurons and simulate it we call that as a point neuron models others say this is not sufficient you have to look at the entire morphological details of the neuron the people who do this they say this is a sufficient details others who look at the molecular level they say no this is not sufficient you have to look at the individual molecules so doing the large scale simulations means involve these different stages so at the blue brain uh, we believe that having a comprehensive approach to uh, navigate these different scales of the brain scale simulation is important and the focus is on reverse engineering the fundamental components inside the brain cells understanding the biophysical system build the conceptual models 
and then simulate that on the computer. So if you look at this, we focus primarily on the morphological detail models, but we can zoom into internal details and do the multi-scale simulations whenever necessary. So this looks interesting, but how all this happens? Uh, I will give a very brief overview. This is the like 10,000 feet view, just in a minute. All this starts with a pu poor rat in the lab. Someone needs to sacrifice, so we start with that. You take the tissue of the brain, you look at the tissue inside a microscope and find out how different cells from the different layers, the compositions of those cells. By looking at those cells, then you do various electrophysiological experiments and find out how those different cells behave under different inputs and different environments. So then you have the, the characterization of the single cell. So people are collecting the data for last 15 or 20 years. This is the data from our lab that you have the then neuron from different layers, from different brain regions that we call the morphological types. You know then from the literature how these neurons are in which layers, in what densities. So based on that, you try to put together those neurons into different layers. Obviously, they have different electrical behaviors that we call the E-types. They basically fire differently. So that you consider while putting that into the circuit and then you connect them together that we call the synaptic connectivity of the cells and then you have the, let's say, biological representations of the model in the computer that you reconstruct based on the data that is collected in the lab. So this we call the reconstruction approach, uh, the bottom-up approach, because all this is a data driven that is collected experimentally. Again, this is very high level. Uh, so this is all the neuroscience. So how MPI comes into the picture in all these simulations. So I'll briefly describe what are the different simulation uh, software tool chains we have and how MPI is used. So the first tool chain that we have in our simulation is we call circuit building tool chain, the process that I just described. So when you take the tissue from, from the microscope, obviously you don't have that a fully intact tissue. When you slice it, obviously it's not intact anymore. So you have to repair that, you have to clone or regrow the branches based, based on the data from the literature or what you see in the lab. So that we call the repair and synthesis. And you put together lots of neurons of different types together to form the circuit. Once you have these cells, the next thing, questions you have to address is what sections of the neurons touch with each other, like the axon of the one cell, how it basically connect to the dendrites of the another. This basically is solved by the touch detector, uh, the software that we have. All the touches that you identify here, the, those are not biologically possible because there are rules how these different neurons can connect together, which layer of neuron can connect it to the another layer of neuron. Uh, th those are biological rules that basically solve by functionalizer. So this movie here shows basically uh, how those, uh, the touch detector find the touches with the different neurons in their proximity. Uh, so in all this process, the algorithms that are being used, you can imagine it's not a static, you know, it's not a grid and you just decompose because number of touches that you will get in the different circuits will be different and will grow ba based on the densities of the cell and, uh, and other, other aspects. So I'm just highlighting here what are the MPI key routines that we need in, uh, in this tool chain. So once you have this circuit building tool chain, what you get is a, a tissue of the brain. So this is just example of the isocortex circuit of 10 million neurons that we built like a six month ago uh, with 10 million unique uh, morphologies, the trillions of exodendroid appositions, which are the connections between these neurons. So you have this tissue. The next thing that people want to do or the neuroscientists want to do is like do a various experiment on this, the, the tissue that you have just rebuilt. 
So the simulation tool chain that we have is based on the widely used neuron software that is being developed for more than 35 years, uh, the primarily at the A Yale University here, and then we are collaborating for last 10, more than 10 to 15 years. Uh, we are optimizing the core algorithm of this software into something called core neuron. So this is the compute library that we use inside. Uh, again, to just touch the MPI aspect, most of the part in the executions basically is updating the states of the individual neuron or the computing the state of the individual neuron. Only 10 to 15 percent of this part is where you have to exchange the spike from the one neuron to another. I will explain that more details into what the spike exchange means. Uh, the important aspect that I have been focusing over the last few years is the DSL uh, that we have to express all the uh, uh, channel properties for the individual neurons. Because neuroscientists don't want to write the C, C++, OpenMP, or CUDA code for every uh, you know, the possible ion channels that you have in the cell. What they do is they express those ion channels into a domain-specific language called N model. And uh, that get translated into optimized backend C++, OpenAC, or CUDA. Uh, what we have been doing is, or primarily I have been working as a DSL source to source compiler that basically look at these different ion channels that are expressed in the DSL. You look at all computational properties of those ion channels and make a better decision while d uh, generating a CUDA, OpenAC, or standard C++ plus base code. So this is simulation tool chain looks like, and this is where primarily the MPI comes into the picture. And the spike exchange, nothing but, let's say you have the, a cell, a particular neuron with a GID7 here. As it receives the input, you basically cr uh, cross your threshold, the spike is generated, and that spike needs to transfer to the destination or the connecting neuron as fast as possible. And there are different uh, MPI routines or spike exchange methods based on like a collectives like all gather or the non-blocking I send receives are being used or in the past when we had the blue gene system, we were using DCMF. This was like multicast based uh, implementation where you can do uh, the fast spike transfer at the hardware level. So some complexities there are based on the neuron types that we have. Obviously, the spike uh, behavior inside the circuit change, you know, the based on the experiments that you want to do. And there is electrical diversity of the neurons in the brain that decide how many firing or the spike events you will have. Uh, number of connections grow as you try to put together large number of cells together. And uh, connectivity from regions to region also change. So these are all things one needs to consider when you look into the MPI performance or spike exchange performance. So everything about the model happens in the computer. And having the possibility to introspect and inspect these models is a great strength. So the, our computing facility sits around like 200 kilometer from where we are based in Geneva. And the visualization team has put together a comprehensive software tool chain to do a detailed neuron uh, visualizations in 3D with a full immersion. And the best example of that is the open deck. This is our immersive 3D ultra high resolution uh, facility for detailed visualization. And there are also tile display walls uh, where people can do explorations of the detailed models. So this tool chain is based on uh, the Intel Osprey library uh, that basically does most of heavy uh, weight for the MPI communications. We don't do a lot of optimizations. And I'm not a visualization guy, but they use uh, a ray tracing technique to do these detailed simulations. So how the computing environment looked like uh, in the project? You heard about the different uh, talks where people presented the large scale systems. So we at the Blue Brain, we are not a HPC center, but we do run a dedicated computing facility. 
So for example, we have been hosting last three generations of the blue gene system. The last one was the blue brain four. That was the four racks of the blue gene Q system with 64,000 cores. We just replaced that with the blue brain five system, uh, which is a combination of the KNLs, the GPUs, the Skylake nodes with the uh, SSDs, and the regular Skylake nodes. And the goal of this computing facility is to have a dedicated uh, systems to enable the research that what we want to do in-house. So for example, this machine is designed for the specific use case with so many uh, different computing elements, KNL, CPUs, GPUs, local SSDs, and then IME for the, uh, the fast I.O that's to enable a specific use cases. For example, the simulations of the plasticity, when we do very long simulations, they are limited by the bandwidth and the KNL offers the good bandwidth. And that's why we added the partitions to do those simulations. When we want to build the large circuits, you need very large memory requirements and we cannot fit that into our circuits. That's why there is a specific partitions with local SSDs where you can run the Spark workloads to do this very large remind, uh, uh, demanding use cases. Until now, we have been using mostly vendor MPI on the system like the BlueGene because you don't have much choice rather than just using what IBM provides. Uh, but with the new system like this that have various components, uh, we have been uh, like testing MVA pitch too uh, in, uh, since last one year. But we always had the visualization clusters for all the 3D visualizations that I just uh, was showing. And the MVA pitch too, uh, uh, there was a default choice. And we have been using that for quite some time. Uh, just to mention about the deployment workflow we have, yesterday Greg mentioned about the SPAC-based deployment workflow, and we have been using uh, the SPAC for quite a long time. And I mean, I, I set up this workflow uh, quite a few years ago. So what this shows is having the pull request on the GitHub for the software from the developers, going that through the GitHub to having a comprehensive build tool chain that basically tests the compilers, the serial libraries, MPI stack, building the modules, testing those with the simulations tool chains, and making that available to the users happen completely you know, 24 by seven in real time. So we don't touch this manually, and every day all the modules get available. So this is how the MPI stacks with SPAC gets deployed in real time on the system. Uh, so how MVA Pitch 2 is helping us in all these explorations? Hari already presented a few examples yesterday and day before yesterday. I will just highlight a few more use cases. As we are building the large circuits, obviously it's like consuming the large input data as well as we are producing large amount of the data. For example, when you run a simulations, you dump lot, lots of the synapse report or the reports for every SOMA. And visualization use case, what you want to do is you have to take the snapshot of all the cells at a particular time T0, let's say, and you have to visualize that snapshot of the frame. But if, when scientists want to do the analysis, they basically look at the one GID and look at the how it uh, uh, basically behaves along the time. So these results into a completely different access patterns on the, the data that we are generating. And that's where the IME, the, the solutions from DDN we are using. And for that, uh, the MUA pitch 2 has been a default choice that is also has been provided by the vendors. And uh, what that uh, allow us to is a standard GPFS uh, deliver about, let's say, 20 gigabyte or 25 gigabyte on the file system we have. Uh, with MVA pitch 2 using uh, DDN, we can get up to 70 to 80 gigabytes for the workloads like this one. So this is just numbers from the IOR, but obviously that helps with the, the use cases that just I mentioned. The second example is of our, uh, the production simulations that we do uh, with a neuron and core neuron simulation tool chain. At the moment, when we do a standard simulations, the MPI is a not a large portion of the execution time. I mentioned that is like five to 
of the total uh, time. But when you increase uh, the number of cores, when you want to do a strong scaling, obviously the computing time decreases and the spike exchange become more important. And this is the example of our standard simulations. You can see MVA pitch 2 doing 10 to 20 persons better than the vendor MPI. But if you just look at the communications time, here we see almost 2x improvement with MVA pitch 2. And all gather V basically even performs 4 to 6x improvement compared to the vendor MPI. This is the work of Hari and other teams of MVA pitch 2. And we believe this will help us as we will move forward and do a strong scaling simulations. The last example uh, tell a bit a different story or the mix, uh, uh, mix story. So the neuron is, uh, is a simulation environment. Like the people write their models in the DSL and they compose the model and then they want to run their own, uh, let's say compute elements with their own circuit. They can also choose their own spike exchange methods, either let's say collectives or point-to-point -point non blocking communications, just via using the scripting interface. And this model was designed with, uh, to trace the MPI communications. And with that, what you see is the simulation time, obviously with MVA pitch two, we're getting like two X better. But the setup time was exploding. Uh, I mean, uh, here if you see the vendor MPI doesn't sh appear here, but MVA pitch two was just exploding with the time. And Harry mentioned this on uh, Monday. This is basically the overhead from different transport protocol and we have to tune those and we, we are working with that. And this is just example of uh, tau profiling showing the all to all V basically was the problematic. And we are trying now to look at this different uh, RC protocols and how to bring that back. So I, I'm just putting that to uh, my, uh, putting that to provide the feedback, uh, what, what we could improve from all this experiment or at least from our initial experience while using MUA pitch two. I think there are here, there are many people who know what it means to deploy the new MPI tool chain in production. That means if you have a particular software stack or all the softwares you have, you have to replace, let's say, Intel MPI with another MPI. For us, what it means is we have computing systems from KNL, GPUs, and Skylakes. Uh, with IME as a one component, you have different compilers. We have different software packages. And we have a different models for the brain regions. That we basically, different versions we build we have different circuits, then you generate a different job script, make sure the results are valid, but the important part of that is basically look at the performance, whether that is correct. And typically on the HPC centers, you will see that we have multiple tool chains and different set of the people use the different tool chains. But in our case, we want to deploy the same stack for our end users. There are no different users, it's just the, you know, the same set of the users. And we do use the different systems at like uh, BlueBrain Fire is our own system, but we use uh, Ulix system or other system in Europe or Argon system. And doing this, all the process is not easy or at least time consuming. So the first, my feedback would be like a tuning performance on the new system. Uh, we heard about like the control variables or the lot of environmental variables that MVA pitch 2 provides like you know there are 40 pages in the user guide and these are the three reactions you know for me depending upon if I am doing the performance optimization as a performance engineer versus if I'm doing the simulator development or if I'm doing the end user. As a performance engineer, I'm very happy to have basically introspection and ability to look into the details. Uh, so I can launch my tool like Tav and look at the details. Uh, for the application developers, there are not that much time because we have to now worry with too many other things, CPU, GPUs, vectorizations, and uh, Intel is coming with something new, so it's exhausting. And the use, as a users of this software, I mean, they basically, they like, they don't know what to do with that, you know, they have no reactions at all. So. The recent example was, for example, when I was running OSU all to all benchmark, let's say I say, I want to test the massage size from eight to 16 bytes. 
I'm doing 10 iterations and no warm up uh, iterations as part of this execution. If OSU benchmark basically uh, have an options where I can, uh, let's say OSU benchmark with MUA pitch to print out all the knobs that are required to improve the performance of all to all V, it might be a different protocol, thresholds or buffer sizes or algorithms for this specific configurations that will help me as a performance engineer. Because currently what we do is we go back and forth to understand which environmental variables for this specific configurations I have to tune and this sometime is quite ex exhaust exhausting. And that basically bring me to the next, uh, next suggestions about something like profile guided optimization that we typically do in the compilers already. So let's say if we have to improve the performance with MPI library, what we typically ask for, we say what is the network configurations of the machine, we say what are the communication patterns of the application, and we say what are the message sizes that this application is using. But this, uh, I haven't used the INAM, but let's say INAM basically find out all the network topology and configurations. You run the INAM, you get the system configurations file, you run, I, let's say we have the, some magic environmental variable that we added. You run application first time. Now the MPI library itself knows what application is using, you know, which uh, collective call we are using, what are the message sizes. So let's say we dump some another configuration file. And next time, if I run the same applications, I have these two configurations file. MPI library can just pick that up and set up everything rather than me setting everything via this environmental variable because this can be done. I'm trying to offload the, my work to the MPI developers, but I think some of this work can be done more automatically than what we currently are doing. So what I just presented as a summary of uh, what is, uh, we do at the Blue Brain is the efforts from the large team at the project. So the credits goes to these people who are working there. Uh, Currently, we are simulating uh, these brain models of up to 10 million neurons or so. If we are to go to the human brain, that's about 80 to 100 billion neuron cells. So there's a lot of challenges to solve. So we have multiple internship positions as well as, well as full-time positions. So if anyone is interested uh, in HPC or computational neuroscience or visualizations, we have uh, multiple positions or talk to me, I will be happy to discuss. Uh, if you want to understand more details about what this is all about, uh, this is the pap paper and the website. Uh, this is from 2015 paper with more than 70 authors and 10 years of the research. You can find out more details there. And I would like to thank you MUA Pitch, T uh, MUA Pitch 2 a team for helping us with all these uh, uh, the efforts that we are doing and thank you for listening.